So more than any other southern state, South Carolina represented the coming of age of American slavery. As in Virginia, slavery had roots stretching far back to the colonial period. And as in the southwestern states in the Trans-Mississippi, the expansion of the Cotton Kingdom made it an expansive rather than a declining institution in South Carolina. The state slaveholding elite had already played an important role in the formation of the American Republic and the US Constitution as the most articulate and fervent advocates of slavery, such as delaying the abolition of the African slave trade until 1808, or including the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution. If you need to know more about what I'm talking about here tonight, just go to New Abolitionist Radio. Just look it up on your Google search, you'll find all about, or just Google my name, Max Harkness. I've written dozens of articles on this, produced hundreds of videos. The people that are on there, I've had direct discussions with them. Okay, so you can find out a lot about what I know just by Googling my name, Max Parkers, of listening in to New Abolitionist Radio. Can you spell your last name? P-A-R-T-H-A-S, Max Parkers. Okay. What we're dealing with right here in this room is a division. We have two groups here. We have a group that believes that slavery never ended, and we're looking at this as slavery, not as something that can be reformed, but something that needs to be abolished. And then we have another group in here who don't see this as slavery, but see this as mass incarceration or some kind of error in judgment over time or mistakes made by people in power that had unforeseen consequences and can be reformed. That is wrong thinking. And what it leads to is what we call cognitive dissonance. Where you have to, you're trying to hold two different competing ideas in your head simultaneously. Double think. Just the term mass incarceration is a misnomer. It didn't even exist until 2007 when Twitter was launched. It was only nine mentions of it by 2009. So now all of a sudden everybody's got these huge organizations based on fighting mass incarceration when there is no mass incarceration. Let me tell you about mass incarceration. The first mass incarceration period was the Atlantic slave trade. The second mass incarceration period was the fugitive slave laws. This is our third mass incarceration period, if you're looking at it in that term. And we're not talking about what they mentioned out there, just 2.4 million people in prisons. That's the low number. Did you know that nearly 14 million people go through the jails alone every year? Eight million people on probation and parole, and we're not even counting the juvenile detention facilities or the immigration centers. We're talking about 24 million people going through this system every year, and every one of those bodies is making money for somebody. Yes. Every single one of them. Entire industries built around this happening. You have to change your mind. You can't keep looking at this as mass incarceration is some mistake, because there is no mistake involved here, you can trace it all the way back to the 13th Amendment. You have to start looking at this as a crime against humanity happening to our people in America right now, and a constitutional crisis. For example, the Fourth Amendment, one of our most basic rights, doesn't exist. Search and seizure, asset seizure, all of these violate your Fourth Amendment rights every single day. The Sixth Amendment, which guarantees us to a fair, a speedy trial by a jury of our peers. Well, let me tell you, 95% of all felony cases end in a plea bargain. If 95% of the cases never even make it to court, how the hell do you have that right? It don't exist. The same thing applies to the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment states that you shouldn't have the excessive bails or torture, and we both know, we all know that those things exist wide scale. But nobody wants to talk about these constitutional amendments that are violating our rights, not just a little, but completely gone. They don't exist. Not in reality, maybe on paper. So it is in our best interest to challenge your own understanding, to challenge it, to start looking at this system that we are living in right now, where one in three black men can expect to go to prison. Try explaining that to your children. 
I got 15 yes. grandchildren, five of them going to prison. You think I want to sit them down and tell them that? So start thinking about these things critically and stop listening to what anybody tells you. This film is groundbreaking. There is no doubt about that. But they don't even talk about the 13th Amendment in the film. They imply slavery never ended, but they give you no options. I'm going to give you an option right here. This cop, cop says, uh, end prison slavery, August 19, 2017. On August 19, we are marching on Washington with demands. It's called the Millions for Prisoners March on Washington, August 19. Our demands is to remove the exception clause from the 13th Amendment. We demand congressional hearings on the effects of the 13th Amendment over the past 152 years, as well as many other things. But it is primarily an abolitionist march. The abolitionists are back. We're here. Forget that reform stuff. Would you be talking about reforming murder? Would you be talking about reforming rape? Would you be talking about reforming genocide? But you want to reform slavery? Come on, people. Make up your minds. Pick one side or the other. Because if you're not looking at this as slavery, then you're working against me. I'm trying to end this. You want to fix it? Then we're not friends. We're not allies. This has to stop, and it has to stop now. I've lost two sons to this system. My father spent 12 years in it. This is a generational curse. And y'all telling us that we can fix this? No, it's wrong. Please, look up New Abolitionist Radio and me. Find out as much as you can about this. The first part of change starts in your own mind. A majority of Carolinian farmers lived in the plantation belt and participated in the slave economy as slave owners, slave hirers, overseers, and patrollers. By 1850, a majority of white households in the state were slaveholding. 